It is my distinct pleasure to have this conversation for DSC Insights with Dr. Irving Bladowski Berger, a renowned leader in the IT industry who has been involved with many of the technologies that drive our digital world today. Irving is one of those rare individuals who has been both a business leader and a research scientist, and they are indeed rare in this industry. He's had a long career at IBM where he led IBM's initiatives, including the internet and e-biz, e-business, supercomputer, supercomputing effort, Linux, one of the earliest open source initiatives that had a profound impact on the computer industry. His list of accomplishments, of course, goes well beyond IBM. After retiring, he was a strategic advisor to Citigroup and MasterCard. He is a research affiliate at MIT Sloan School of Management and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Scientists. Irving is also a fellow at the Center for Global Enterprise, a founding member of OpenEBL, and he has his own blog, IrvingWB.com, where he writes about emerging technologies, including some we will be discussing today. Irving, welcome to DSE Insights. Hi, it's a pleasure talking to you. It's my pleasure as well. Uh, let's go right into it. Uh, Irving, you're, you're also a technology advisor to OpenEBL, which is a new initiative committed to advancing global trade by deploying open source standards mm -hmm. uh, based electronic bill of lading. So we're interested in finding out why, why is it so important to create an open source standard for electric bill, electronic bill of lading? I mean, after all, people have been using paper bills of lading for centuries now. Well, um, this goes back to my past. So as you know well, I've been in the IT industry. You know, I've worked at IBM for many years. And the IT industry in the 1980s was all proprietary technologies and companies didn't like to work with each other. And every company had a proprietary network. IBM had system network architecture, digital had DECnet, and on and on and on. And it was really a pain, for example, just to send an email from a company using IBM email to a company using digital or HP email. Then in the 1990s, the internet came up and the World Wide Web came up and it absolutely transformed the IT industry, but absolutely transformed it. And the reason it did that is that all of a sudden we can all communicate with each other. I don't mean just the people in the industry, but our customers and our customers' customers. They could exchange email with each other relatively easily because there were open standards for email, the internet, everybody used TCP IP. TCP IP was not just open, but everybody had access to the open source implementations of the TCP IP protocols. Same with the World Wide Web. Before, it was very difficult to get access to information. All of a sudden, the web was built. You know, initially it took a little while for companies to agree on common standards for browsers. So regardless of the browser from the company that you were interacting with, all the browsers could access all information on websites. And that transformed the world. It led to electronic commerce. It led to the ability to, to exchange research papers and on and on and on. And it was only made possible by the open standards and the open source implementations of those standards. So I've seen the incredible positive impact that the internet and the web and later Linux had on the IT industry. And I think it's a force of good. Supply chains are really, really important. I mean, I think we all were sensitized to their importance when all of a sudden COVID came 
and you know you couldn't get um you couldn't get lots of things you couldn't get uh, ways to clean your hands and and companies realized how difficult it was to find alternate suppliers because they didn't know who were the suppliers or their suppliers because it was all so uh, non-transparent and bringing technology to supply chain and helping the companies involved in supply chains get a lot of the advantages that we got with the internet and the web is absolutely paramount. So that's a very long way of saying why as soon as uh, Chris and you asked me to get involved with the EBL initiative, I say, absolutely, that's that's exactly the kinds of things I like to work in. So the open standards development of uh, electronic bill of lading will I uh, assume provide cost descent, uh, cost uh, efficiencies, obviously transparencies. Uh, there's also benefit. Reduce I would imagine. Reduce errors. Mm -hmm. Make it harder to have a, a problem. By the way, it won't stop errors because a bill of lading. You know, somebody can make a mistake and and put the wrong amount or whatever and humans make errors. However, when there is a discrepancy, like, did you send me the right invoice? Did you pay the invoice? Instead of having to hire forensic analysts to now go over all the paper of all the companies, if the bill of ladings have been digitized and available to all, you can figure out what happened and you can quickly fix the problem, whereas if it's paper, it, it could take a month or two to figure it out. Right, and it solves some of the fraud issues or helps prevent fraud. And uh, you know, let's not forget the sustainability issues with all that paper that's produced exactly. by supply chains. So the open source effort is really a collaboration. We're trying to. Yes. Uh, EBL is trying to gather uh, stakeholders of supply chains right. to collaborate on this standard. Um, and that will force in, uh, interoperability, I would imagine, in the industry. But what is um, what is needed to gain momentum uh, in the marketplace for this open standard? I mean, after all, you know, the Internet has been around for a while. Everyone's been using and doing e-commerce. And yet this this seems to be one stubborn application that is still stuck in an analog world. Yeah, supply chain, I used to think, to be honest, especially when blockchain technology started to appear maybe five years ago. And, and you know, initially people talk about blockchain technologies for the finance industry because money was flowing around and so on. And the finance industry is super complicated. Trying to explain how banks deal with each other, the role of the credit card, the role of the banks, and on and on and on. You know, only people, as I learned because of my consulting with Citigroup and MasterCard, the only people who know how it all works are a set of almost priests that they keep hidden very carefully protected, and it's incredible how well it works, even though it, when I said, give me the documents to read so I understand how it works, turns out there are no documents. <laughs> it's in the brains of the people who make sure it works. I used to think, well, supply chains, which is another application that the early uh, users of enterprise blockchains started to use, I thought, well, supply chains are so much easier because you can explain how supply chains work in a long elevator ride. I mean, everybody knows about supply chains. You order something, it gets shipped, you pay for it. So that's clearly the killer app of blockchains. 
and Ira, what I learned, by the way, let me tell you an anecdote. I told a top professor at MIT, Yossi Sheffi, who's written a number of books on supply chains, my thinking that supply chains would be the killer app of blockchain. He was very polite, but he essentially said, Irving, you don't know what you're talking about. And what he really meant is you don't realize how incredibly complicated supply chains are. Remember, he's the head of a major MIT uh, uh, lab that works on uh, supply chains and how to make them resilient and how they should do you improve them. And here comes Irving thinking, well, you know, I work on the internet, so therefore, uh, I know a lot about this. And he was absolutely right. The more I've learned about supply chains, the more I see how complicated they are. And I believe there are probably three major reasons. Supply chain is a highly collaborative venture among multiple companies from around the world, correct? I mean, you order things and so on. And it's not just the private sector companies because when you order things from another country, when it leaves that country, it has to go through the customs of that country. And when it gets to the country of the receiver, it has to go through the customs of that country. And then you have the people who order, the people who receive, you have the shipping company. Often there are trucks involved on each side. Uh, there are ships involved, maybe airplanes. There may be railroads involved. And the poor bill of lading has to be passed around to all these people. And it's amazing how well they have worked <laughs> in a paper-based environment. So the, the complexity is one problem. Second, collaborating among companies around the world who compete with each other and don't necessarily trust each other is very difficult. And, uh, you know, it, it, if something goes wrong, or if you say, help us build this together, the company starts thinking, gee, if, if you take the lead here, I, you compete with me, are you going to try to take advantage of me? And you swear up and down, you don't do that, you're a great person. But you know, companies compete. And competition is at the heart of our market-driven system. And so to get companies to collaborate with each other is very, very difficult. And, and then when you bring a brand new technology, whether it is a digitizing, absolutely. You know, remember a lot of supply chain, that's why EBL is here, has been with paper documents. So all of a sudden you say, I have to digitalize it. And then you start talking about new uh, technologies like electronic digital ledgers, blockchains, et cetera. And you say, well, this is a piece of cake. I've been using the internet to send emails. So this is a piece of cake, not so fast. And so if people don't realize, as I didn't until I learned better, that these things are complicated, you start making promises that, oh, in three years, this will be a done deal, instead of realizing that this very complex initiative take time. And they cannot be done just quickly. You, I mean, you can, you can say that, but then it's hype. You have to take time and they should be done in an incremental manner rather than to swallow the whole supply chain at once. And 
uh, the EBL initiative that starts with digitizing the electronic bill of lading as the first step feels absolutely right to me. Take the first step, and once you have that, then you take the next step, could be digital payments, and then the step after that, there are quite multiple steps, and do this incrementally as opposed to swallowing the thing all at once. And that, that, that's what I find so fascinating. Well, I, I don't think you were the only person who thought blockchain was the killer app uh, for supply chains. Uh, but you mentioned trust, and uh, that's an important factor here. And totally. I think it also goes toward what you mentioned about um, incremental progress here. Yes. And that uh, supply chains are so complex that you, you can't boil the ocean, as they say. Yes. You really need to focus on that one effort uh, when we when we talk about um, you know supply chains and electronic bill of lading. Killer app is is a, a way overused uh, term in, in the IT industry, but yes. you know uh, we're talking about uh, a bill of lading that just runs through the entire supply chain. You don't have a supply chain without an, uh, a, a right. bill of lading, so. Is this the app that really drives uh, digitization of the, of the supply chain? It's if the we first agree one. This? If you don't have a bill of lading, you don't have a supply chain because the bill of lading, it, this is like, if you say, you know, I just ordered something and I said, oh, so you went online or, or, you, or wherever you went or you sent an email saying, send me something. That's the equivalent of the bill of lading for a consumer. You have to expressly tell the person who is going to ship you what you order, this is what you order. Obviously, in a supply chain among companies around the world, the bill of lading is much more complicated because you're going to order multiple things and you're not just going to order a pair of shoes. You're going to order all kinds of things. You want a discount if you pay early. All that information is in the bill of lading. That's the critical record from which everything starts. And therefore, it, it is clearly the first step in any kind of global digital supply chain. Start with the bill of lading. And as that works, then you can go more and more and more and more. I want to go back to the uh, the idea of trust um, in, in developing an open source standard. And the bill of lading in and of itself generates a ton of data. Yes. And what I would imagine is companies are concerned, or all stakeholders in the supply chain would be concerned about who has access to my data. Right. Which I would say, would suggest is a roadblock to collaboration because companies tend not to trust competitors, as you mentioned, involved in this. So how do you develop that sense of, of trust in the industry to drive what on the surface seems like such an easy cost savings, efficiency, transparency, sustainability, you can check off the list of benefits. And yet it has been a struggle for yeah. so many years to get a standard uh, through. Well, um... You know, while blockchain technologies, if you look at them in total, are really complicated and they take time, blockchain also introduced some very important things in the dealing between companies, which is the notion of using encryption of using cryptographic signatures, both to decide who are the participants in this overall supply chain, and then for any specific transaction within that supply chain, only the sender and receiver, let's say of the bill of lading, get to see that bill of lading. You don't want your competitor to get to see that. And so 
let's say unlike emails, which, you know, generally we don't encrypt emails. I know some people will say, Irving, you use, I don't know, WhatsApp or whatever, it's encrypted, but, but you know, emails, you don't apply that, that level of care that you apply to an invoice or you apply to a bill of lading. And the, uh, if you look at the architecture of the EBL initiative, it starts with the fact that uh, cryptography, everything will be encrypted. And there will be the encryption for all the members of the supply chain. So that only if somebody for that particular supply chain has been quote unquote led into the club, that is they they are part of the, the supply chain, do they get access to it? And then for every transaction, there is a specific a, a cryptographic signature so that only people who have the key are able to access it. Now, cryptography is something that people have used now for decades. So it's not a new technology. That doesn't make it any simpler. <laughs> so if you have to understand how cryptography works to use a supply chain, it's all over. Because that's not... However, you want to trust that the people who've built the infrastructure understand how cryptography works. And uh, if part of the reason of building your applications on an open source infrastructure is because the different members of the specific supply chain, if they want to inspect the code, that doesn't mean they'll see the actual cryptographic keys, but if they want to see the software that manages all that, because they don't trust that Irving, you know, has, it, it, it's an honest uh, supplier, you can see the software, like, here. Take a look, be my guest. And that is a reason why at the level of the lower layers of an infrastructure where people will build applications for collaborating, you want it to be open source. If somebody doesn't trust that, I don't know, the TCP IP protocols in the internet that somebody's using uh, are the right protocols or they don't trust the Linux implementation. Okay, Linux is open source. Have, have a go at it if you have nothing better to do. And, and that's, what, that's why open source software has been so successful, not just with Linux, but you know, the, the Linux Foundation has over a thousand projects in just about every single industry. And then you have different other open source uh, members of different other industries. And it's been around for 25 years, very successful. It's worked very well. And it's what, changed the whole software industry. It has changed not just the software industry, it has changed the whole IT industry. And then it has changed major users of IT industry that use it in engineering, in, 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 in marketing, in sales. You know, industry after industry builds on them. Now, it doesn't mean everything they use is open source, but the common layers on which they build are open source. And then on top of it, there will be proprietary applications that you can sell, you can use, you can build, whatever. And that's the approach that I think the whole 
a open EBL initiative starting with EBL is taking to build supply chain systems over time. So open EBL will um, not be not use blockchain, but blockchain characteristics like absolutely. They will use the blockchain technologies that are appropriate, and they will use other technologies as necessary to get the job done. You've had a lot of experience with uh, open source uh, uh, efforts with your days at, at IBM. Yes. What what have you learned from that experience, and what lessons can you uh, can be applied to the development of this Open EBL standard? Well, the let's say the first lesson. Let me go back. Where did open source come from? Well, if you said, well, where did the internet come from? came from the research community. Think, lest we forget, the internet was started by the US Department of Defense to build a network that was very resilient, that everybody could use, started the effort in 1969, and it was built by research communities in universities, in research labs, in government labs. So 20 years later, in the late 80s, you say, my God, the, the, the internet took that long? Well, <laughs> yes, it took that long because they were doing something very new that had never been done before. All of a sudden, uh, it became commercialized in the early 90s. It was only used by research communities and universities and so on until then. And then it started to get used in the commercial world. Same with the World Wide Web. I think there is a, everybody knows, they've probably forgotten it by now, that the World Wide Web was first developed by Tim Berners-Lee in CERN, which is a high energy physics lab in Geneva that, you know, uh, that's where the Higgs boson was found and all kinds of things like that. And he and his team developed the World Wide Web to help physicists around the world exchange information in a, in a simple way, a website and so on. And of course, then uh, Mark Andreessen uh, in the early 90s, when he was a student at the University of Illinois, he and a group of people developed the notion of the browser, which made it so much easier to access websites everywhere and the rest is history. And all of this came from the research community and it was all open software. Why was that open software? Because if it wasn't open, they couldn't collaborate with each other. This is why you and I are speaking English because we both know English. And so I speak, you understand, and we can collaborate with each other and we can do this webcast. And it took a while to convince, let's say when, when IBM first embraced Linux, it took a while to convince our commercial customers that this was a good thing. When we said in 2000, we are embracing Linux across all of our products and services, they said, are you out of your mind? How can you embrace something that was developed by a group of people we don't know? And the answer is because they are the best and brightest programmers from around the world who come together to collaborate and there is a and 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 there is a discipline with Linus Torvald as the top maintainer to make sure that you only accept code that works that you transfer the IP to to the Linux Foundation so th this is not something you do uh, willy-nilly there, there is a lot of discipline 
in how open source software gets handled. Also, when uh, we did this, there were some companies that hated Linux because it competed with their proprietary software. And so, you know, so IBM and other companies, including HP, Intel, Hitachi, and others, form what became the Linux Foundation later, which has absolutely grown since those days to protect Linux. So that if somebody sued Linux and people did, and they sued IBM and they sued other uh, collaborators with Linux, and you know, we, we could put our patents behind it saying, look, we protect it with our patents and different companies then open source their software. And remember to open source software, you need to own it. <laughs> I cannot give something I don't own. So the IP was a big part of that. And that's why lawyers got involved. And we had David Kapos who was my key intellectual property lawyer at IBM. He went from there to become the head of the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, and he's really a top lawyer in the EBL initiative now. So this is a very, very serious thing, but it starts with make sure that you make it possible and legal for companies to collaborate in an endeavor. So, so really, it comes back to trust again. You, it you comes back to trust. Yeah, but remember, it's not just the trust of let's go have a beer. It's also the, I mean, that's good, but it's the trust that everybody can see the, so the software. The software has to be open source under an open source license. There are multiple licenses. Some of them are very restrictive, like the GNU license, others like the MIT license, or other kinds of licenses are a little bit less restrictive. But every open source software has a license attached to it. And therefore, as in the EBL initiative, it is built on open source software, that software is based on a specific license. So Irving, I, I, one more last question and then I'll let you go. I appreciate your time today. Uh, there have been so many efforts to establish uh, an open standard for EBL and uh, to facilitate trade um, globally. And today we see other efforts around uh, yet it's taking so long, you know, and against this environment where, you know, you, you've gone through the history of open source, but here we are today. And I think I would imagine that people are more comfortable with open source. They understand the benefits. So what is taking or what has hindered efforts to develop these standards, um, especially after the pandemic, when we saw, you know, the debacle on supply chains and frustration, um, you know, where's our supplier? Even some companies didn't even know, you know, the stakeholder, their, their third, fourth tier suppliers. Right. So it was a very confused time. What is it that has um, stymied efforts to gain traction for uh, these standards? Well, I think part of it is people didn't take an open approach to build common layers of open protocols on which to build so, uh, supply chain services. So yes, you wanted people to use applications built by a few companies, but one problem is those same companies compete had competitors and you wanted those competitors as clients but you didn't reach out to them as partners in building the um you know the supply chain applications as an analogy let's say when IBM embraced Linux if we told 
our competitors in the IT industry. Uh, okay, IBM now is going to work, we'll, we'll build Linux, and you can use our Linux. They say, no. If you want us to help build Linux and use Linux, we want we need to be partners with you. We need to make sure we do this. We cannot just be your customers. We need to be your partners. And I think the early efforts for in, in let's say using blockchain for supply chains didn't reach out enough to multiple companies to be partners in building the applications as opposed to just being users of the applications that got built by a couple of companies. So that was one mistake in retrospect. Remember, I, I, th there is no malice here. It's just right, right. you only discover what doesn't work once you do it and you say, gee, it's not working. I think a second thing has been, I think the lesson that I learned that this is really complicated supply chains. And we were reminded of that during the pandemic for all the reasons you and I have discussed. But you know, before that we assume, hey, it's a supply chain. So I don't know. Uh, Apple needs to build iPhones. They contract with a Chinese company who is going to manufacture it. It's a done deal. It works. They don't see all the layers. And as you said, contractors of contractors of contractors. And it's not just true of iPhones. It's true of Mr. Clean. You say, Mr. Clean that's just, I don't know, something for cleaning. Well, but something for cleaning uses chemicals. Those chemicals have to use from some place. And maybe those chemicals have other providers. And so all of a sudden, when we couldn't get the right cleaning products during COVID, we realized this is more complicated than we thought. What was wrong? Why can't I get this stuff? Or masks or ventilators. I mean, on and on and on and on. And so we were all sensitized. And so, and when I say all, I don't mean consumers, different companies that it was really important to collaborate so you can make supply chains much more resilient uh, than they have been in the past. And so people are taking what I would say, it, I, I don't mean to say it's a more serious, it's a more realistic approach because the other, the approaches that didn't work were serious approaches. I don't mean to imply they weren't serious and what often happens with technologies, with exciting new technologies, and Ira, we see that with AI right now, artificial intelligence, when the technology first shows up, there is a lot of hype. We saw that with the internet. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're too young to remember the dot-com bubble. <laughs> I, I wish I was too young. Thank you. I think that I think even if people look at both of us, they'll say that's a joke, Irving. And uh, I'm sure when uh, you were, you know, a reporter, you interviewed a lot of companies about their startups and their plans for their companies, and you saw many of them go belly up because you know they were unrealistic. That always happens. If you look at the history of technology, technological revolutions that economic historians like Carlota Perez have written about, every time you get a technological revolution, people get all excited. The financial community say, here is a tremendous opportunity 
to invest in these startups, make huge amounts of money, and you get hype. And, and we see we're going through that with AI right now. And so you need you you need time for things to calm down, and then the real work starts. And that happened with the internet. You know, once the bubble burst, then things started to proceed and then we got smartphones and we got internet of things and we're getting more and more things. And I think that's happening with supply chains now. Well, it also seems that this approach is much more, I don't want to say conservative, but a building block. It's realistic. Let me, let me use the term yeah. realistic that start with bill of lading and then add the next one probably digital payments so that people can use the bills with a financial partner who will handle the payments. And at some point you have to get to customs applications that are trusted by government. So you start, you're going to need governments to get involved because you know they, they, they will have to participate yeah. in the custom applications. And of course there are shippers all over the place. And there are multiple companies that compete in shipping products over cargo ships, over airplanes, over trucks. And, you know, one of the things my friend Jerry Cuomo, who is an IBM fellow, who was very involved in developing blockchain technologies and especially Hyperledger which are open source implementations. One of the things he told me is he didn't realize how that so the supply chain world was not very advanced in digitalization, that if you go to a port, you see a lot of people with bills of lading on paper in the late, late 2010s. And if that's the state of major parts of the sector and you start introducing wonderful digital technologies, they don't know what to make of it because it's not as if digitalization has entered that industry sector as well and that's a lot of what takes time is the education of the members of the industry and so on. But, you know, eventually that happens and, and this industry sector becomes far more efficient. Well, Irving, I, I think you've begun the education process and uh, I look forward to uh, working with you in the future. And uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ira. It's always a pleasure to work with you. <laughs>